everybody. Welcome to our third event in the series of our affordable housing virtual forums. Thanks everybody for being able to join us today. We really appreciate your participation at such a busy time. My name is Arvona Zwiers and I'm the Director of Social Housing here at the County of Simcoe. And very, very happy to be uh, providing some welcoming remarks this morning from the county. I'd like to first of all, um, I acknowledge that we have several councillors in attendance today. We have county councillors, uh, Mayor Brian Saunderson from the town of Collingwood, Mayor Mike Burkett from the township of Severn, and Mike is also our vice chair of the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. We have Deputy Mayor Barry Burton from Clearview Township, and we have Deputy Mayor Anita Dubow from the town of Penetanguishene. In terms of our local municipal councillors, welcome to City of Orillia Councillor Jay Fallis, who also is a recent uh, new member of the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. Um, from the town of Penetanguishene, we have Councillor Jill St. Thomas, and from the town of Innisfil, we have Councillor Alex Walters. Walters, beg my pardon. Um, welcome to all of you and thank you so much for um, your um, interest as elected officials in important issues that have to do with uh, affordable housing. So this morning we're very pleased um, to introduce Graham Cubitt, Director of Projects and Development at Indwell. Um, Graham will be sharing with us a presentation on creating energy efficiency through passive housing. Uh, personally, I'm really excited to um, be learning more about this uh, particular topic. Um, we also welcome Arlene Etchen from Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, as well as Katie Bailey from the township from the town of Innisfil, who will bring additional experience and resources today to today's uh, conversation. So, um, no welcoming remarks would be uh, full without identifying um, a few housekeeping notes. So just for um, for your information, today's session is being recorded and following the session, uh, the recording will be made available on the county's website, which is located at www.simco.ca forward slash our AHPPS. Now, please note that during the presentation, you can feel free to use the Q&A box, which is on the right of your screen to submit a question to our team. And we, we actually have 85 or more people registered for today, so it's quite a large group. Um, and because of this, the moderator will actually group questions that have similar themes or similar nature, and that will allow us uh, the opportunity to, ad to address a greater number of your questions as we go through this session. Please do note that if you find your question hasn't been answered, um, and because we don't have time or we don't have the answer during this session, staff will actually reach out further uh, and follow up with an email response to you. Also with respect to questions, if you wish to direct your specific question to as either a staff or to a specific presenter, please place the at symbol followed by your name or, or followed by the presenter or staff's name in the Q&A chat box and then followed by your question. And that way we'll know who you would like to address your question to. So I'm really looking forward to this presentation. And so without further ado, Graham, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here this morning and uh, really uh, look forward to sharing this, uh, sharing from our experience as Indwell and uh, look forward uh, mostly to uh, the question and answer time, just being able to have a dialogue around uh, the issues that we we know are pressing as a community. So let me see if I can get my uh, screen sharing correctly here. Perfect. OK. Great. Well, uh, very briefly, uh, uh, my name is Graham Cubitt. I'm the director of projects and development with Indwell. We're a Hamilton based uh, charity that develops affordable housing communities for people seeking health, wellness and belonging. And uh, I'm happy to talk to you about energy efficiency through passive housing. Um, over the last uh, about 40 odd years, we've uh, evolved as a nonprofit and as a charity uh, from a small group home operator in the 1970s to now one of Ontario's larger uh, supportive housing providers. We have over 700 tenants uh, in four municipalities and we're soon to be in five. 
Um, and really our goal is to see lives transformed for our tenants uh, through affordable housing and supports. Um, this is, uh, is, is the tenants is our focus. Uh, you know, our mission is to create affordable housing communities for people seeking health, wellness and belonging. Our vision is hope and homes for all. And we're rooted in uh, the Christian values, but broadly shared values of dignity, love and hope to actually be able to help inspire people to achieve their best and, uh, and their most uh, successful futures, um, despite the barriers they may face regarding poverty, illness or addiction. We do know that uh, when people have affordable housing, um, it is a great starting point for many other areas of life to come together. And so uh, one of our challenges has been over time, how do we change the things that we can change? We're not really in a position as an organization to change people's incomes, um, but if we can help them afford their housing so that broadly speaking, um, they're not living in a state of constant crisis related to, to the core essentials of life, then many of the other uh, services and supports of our community uh, can help uh, round out people's lived experience. Over the past uh, 15 years, I guess, in total, but uh, particularly the last 10 years, Indwell has taken all of our historic experience providing the supports and actually developed a strong uh, real estate development capability. We realized that, you know, like everyone, we were advocating for more affordable housing to be created, but uh, how were we going to get that done? And uh, we realized we needed to maybe be part of the solution. And so over, uh, over the past decade or so, particularly, uh, we've actually developed a number of buildings and our, our journey towards high performance started with some projects where we were renovating or retrofitting uh, buildings and uh, shooting for uh, you know, the HPNC high performance new construction approach or other uh, ways. So the building on the left is a new construction. Uh, the two on the right are retrofit buildings uh, where we converted old bars or uh, or um, civic buildings uh, into affordable apartments. We also know that, uh, you know, sometimes we're dealing with heritage buildings or trying to create workplaces for uh, for people to come together. And so that's uh, an added complexity to some of our projects where it's like, how do we how do we bring energy efficiency and uh, good good design together for these kinds of spaces? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, conversion or adaptive reuse reuse has been a part of that experience. And the the building on the left there, uh, Harvey Woods Lofts, is an old mill conversion, uh, knitting mill conversion in Woodstock, transforming a former industrial building. That was a, one of our first attempts to really get off greenhouse gas emissions and uh, it has a large geothermal system off of uh, an aquifer below. So we, we have uh, an open loop system through the aquifer where we use the water and the energy there uh, to really help us drive down our greenhouse gas emissions. And then projects where on like on the right hand side where we've taken uh, infrastructure that was already existing in the community and transformed it through adaptive reuse and, re you know, full top to bottom renovation, but really trying to say there's a lot of embodied energies and a lot of uh, resources that have been uh, used already in our community. How do we take advantage of that uh, and move forward? But one of the big challenges we recognized was that um, in order for us to uh, continue to advance our own uh, our own abilities and also uh, make make good on the commitments that we are pledging to as a, as a charity, we needed to do something about our energy use. We're, we, we're all impacted by the cost of utilities and the cost of energy. And, um, you know, as a charity, we're making commitments 20, 30, 40, 50 years out to retain the affordability of our projects for tenants uh, because we are using or often deploying uh, civic investments. And we thought, well, we're, we're doing pretty good. You know, on the chart there at the right hand side, you can see sort of typical building uh, multi multi unit residential buildings might use around 300 kilowatt hours per year in energy and some of our buildings were a bit better than that 200 maybe or 175 um, but then how do we actually cut those numbers down dramatically and we needed a different way of approaching how we looked at buildings and it was in 2016 that we we settled on using passive house uh, strategies to um, really drive down our energy use and uh, enable us to get off of using gas as a cheap source of fuel uh, because of its impacts on uh, on climate. Um, we know that we're uh, we have no mechanisms to recover for climate, uh, you know, carbon taxes or other things like that. We can't pass on the costs 
that may come from those in the future. And so we needed to sort of future ready ourselves um, as an organization and also to do the right thing. And so, you know, the Passive House 5 principles I'll, I'll use as the guide as I highlight some of our experience uh, through photos uh, to take a look at how we went through that learning journey and, uh, and what we've learned along the way. Um, air thermal bridging was the number one thing that we realized. Uh, we had no idea we were paying attention to, we weren't paying attention to as a design team or, or through the process of developing, and we had to really come to grips with it. You know, on the left hand side there, there's a picture of, um, you know, some of the thermal, uh, the, the insulation on the outbound side of the structure, uh, putting things like balconies on independent structures. Uh, when we're attaching uh, insulation to the exterior of the building, using things like the screws as the mechanism to uh, hold the insulation on through the strapping, but really to, to fundamentally look at the issue of thermal bridging through the building envelope. It was, it was the number one thing our whole design team uh, wrestled with to understand how, how often and how prevalent thermal bridges were through the building. Simple things like even, uh, you know, coming up through the floor, uh, you can see from the top left photo there, uh, the way that the insulation and the air tightness passes down into the structure or, or below the structure of the building uh, right into the foundations. It's very, it's been very critical to sort of analyze each of those steps along the way and probably one of the biggest areas where we um, where the rethinking had to happen. Um, you can see some of these photos here, the strategies to um, particularly below grade strategies to minimize the, um, the those thermal bridges, putting the insulation even right under the foundation, uh, as in the case there in the middle, uh, or starting right at the sides of the footing and moving right up. Um, or in the case of the picture on the right hand side, uh, looking at how in a, in a parking structure, how do you insulate the interior spaces from exterior spaces um, that have to still have a structural or, um, or, or fire rating issue uh, within a parking structure. I think I may have, uh, no, was, that's okay. There's one more there. Uh, you can see in some of the pictures as well, you know, as the building goes up, uh, we've on all each of our projects, we've uh, used a different uh, structural system or a different approach. Um, on the on the bottom left there, you can see a typical sort of core slab or concrete deck, prefabricated concrete deck with uh, steel steel studding. Um, that's not really that great for thermal bridging, uh, but it's a very conventional uh, style of building. Uh, that is a building that uh, we're shooting for passive house certification through PHI. Um, so all of the insulation in that case is outbound. Uh, the middle photo at the bottom is a hybrid of that. It's a core slab deck style building, but using wood fill in uh, in, in framing uh, because of the thermal properties of the, uh, the wood being much better than the steel studs. The bottom right, you can see where the parapet wall comes above the roof line. Uh, using wood instead of steel for that. And then on the steel frames or the steel posts where there needs to be additional structure, there's a large block of uh, what's called armatherm, uh, a, a heavy duty insulation that's actually structural foam uh, that that steel post can bolt down through. So it's, it's little details like that uh, within the overall system that really help to minimize those thermal bridges because otherwise so much energy is just transferred through uh, each of those structural elements. The top right, you can see there how the window is, is mounted outbound of the structure actually sitting on a fiberglass angle. And on that building, the, um, the windows moved into the insulation plane, which is outside of the building. And uh, in that case, it was a, a spray foam insulation that we used. Pro products that we found along the way in order to help with that thermal bridging included the uh, green girts, uh, which were from a manufacturer in Michigan, I believe. Uh, a fiberglass girt with no through steel, uh, but allowed us to bring out the, um, the, the the strapping outward so that the insulation, six inches of insulation could be on the outside uh, and then mounting the um, exterior rain screen system to those to those girts. And then in the top left corner, an example on a roof where mechanical units 
uh, sit. Very typical to have those sitting on sort of a steel frame or something like that, but using a, a wood system to minimize the, uh, the thermal transmission from the roof deck up through the, uh, up through the roofing insulation, uh, which in that case was uh, 10 inches. Um, and then uh, using the, the wood structure there to uh, set the rooftop units on. The second big area where we uh, really had to focus uh, attention was on air tightness. And I think that uh, if we're familiar with high performance buildings of any kind, uh, uh, we know that air tightness makes a difference. In passive house, you actually have to hit certain standards, uh, no more than 0.6 air changes per hour um, for, for, for the testing. Uh, we were very worried about that as a team and as contractors in the first uh, few iterations, but then have actually realized that um, with attention to detail, which is very critical, uh, it's actually not that difficult to achieve very, very impressive air tightness tests. And in our most recent project, uh, the final air tightness test hit 0.2 air changes per hour. It is interesting to match personalities to the task. Uh, you know, you can see the uh, the detailing of the blue skin being folded around the foundation, ang uh, the angles of the foundation there in the bottom left corner, or the, uh, you know, the uh, installer putting the tapes around the window in the top right corner. Uh, you know, you have to match the personality to the task and uh, attention to detail is really important uh, when picking the right people uh, from the from the team to actually do the installation of these air tightness membranes or, or paying attention to those those factors. And then, of course, getting a team that's uh, knowledgeable or you have to hire a consultant, obviously, somebody who can do the air tightness testing. And uh, even in that process, learning how to do it on these large scale buildings uh, is something that um, uh, folks in the air tightness testing industry have been uh, learning along the road with us. The picture on the right hand side, the green building there, it's an example where we actually have realized that if you're using Zipboard in the system like that, rather than cutting in all the windows before you do the first air tightness test, just leave it all up. And then that gives the first baseline test, which is a, a strategy our contractor realized um, as they were going along. A couple other photos here of some of the air tightness detailing. Uh, the top right corner there is the is, is a window detailing, so the taping on the inside uh, rather than the taping on the outside is something we learned. Uh, it's a way to uh, do a lot of the work inside without having to be up on a lift. Um, there's uh, different approaches. Uh, on the bottom left hand side, you can see one of the buildings was a retrofit. So figuring out on the exterior surface how to level everything up and and and, and standardize it so that when the blue skin went on, it was a very continuous surface. Um, on the middle, and the the bottom middle picture is uh, some of the products uh, from Suprema in this case uh, that are being used for air tightness on the roofing. Many of these products that we're finding are are not uh, are readily available. Uh, they're not particularly expensive. It's just uh, figuring out how to apply them in the right sequences and, and getting the contractors familiar with using them. And then the one picture on the right there is uh, an example of when it comes to air tightness. That's uh, if you're following the FIA standard, the Passive House Institute US standard, it actually requires internal compartmentalization testing as well. So uh, being able to take a look at the building, um, not just as a whole for the air tightness, but actually air trans transfer between units. And so one of the things we realized uh, through that process was it's important to actually frame out and uh, and board uh, the apartment uh, perimeter, roof, the ceiling, the walls, before doing all the internal framing. And uh, and that made it very feasible to achieve uh, air tightness for each unit. Um, if you put all of the framing in beforehand, uh, which we did on a previous project, uh, you realize it was harder to actually achieve the air tightness uh, for the compartmentalization. There's constant innovations. Uh, in materials, and this is one of the things that uh, is, is kind of exciting for people who like research is uh, is finding these different products and, and seeing what's out there in the market. Many of these are not actually that expensive. Uh, some of them are, some of them can be quite expensive and, and you have to make a decision, especially when it's affordable housing around uh, what are you going to invest in, you know, for the, you know, so the whiz bangness of it, or, or what are you just going to uh, say, you know, we can go with something uh, more familiar. Um, but some of the products that um, you know we use, which are not super common but are readily available, are 
uh, air sealed boxes. So in between units, to, in order to get that compartmentalization, a standard elec interior electrical box would just be metal. Uh, but we use these um, uh, these plastic boxes, which have an air seal gasket, so that it became very easy to deal with uh, the compartmentalization. Interestingly, one of, one of the feedbacks we're getting from our maintenance team is that it's actually making it easier to deal with things like, you know, pest management or, or um, you know, complaints from tenants about uh, odors, etc. When the units are compartmentalized, uh, there's far less transfer, obviously, of anything between units, which is uh, very positive. And then on the bottom photo on the left there, you can see uh, some of the expanding foam tapes. Uh, that we've been uh, experimenting with or using on different project projects, um, which are really phenomenal how much you can roll that tape on and then it just expands into the gap between the, the window and the, and the window frame uh, or the window buck in order to really seal those uh, seal those gaps rather than sometimes the spray foam in a can, it, it can appear to have pretty good uh, fill, but it's not necessarily completely uniform. Continuous insulation is obviously another one of the key passive house principles and uh, in each project that we've worked on, um, uh, there's been a somewhat different approach depending on the, the context. The bottom building there, you can see a complete uh, spray foam of the outside of the building. That was a retrofit of a, of a building. The majority of that building was a retrofit. Many different building systems, masonry, etc. Lots of different openings and uh, there was no way to put all the insulation necessary inside. So we uh, we did blue skin the building as sort of like a, an extra layer of air tightness. Um, it was our first project to Passive House and, and uh, using the Enerfit retrofit standard. But then we spray foamed the complete building uh, using um, the uh, uh, Elastochem, um, can't remember the full brand name, but it's uh, from Elastochem in Brantford and actually had a global warming potential of one. Unlike the conventional uh, spray foams available at the time, which had a global warming potential of uh, over 1,000, so even there, trying to make sure that we're using products which have a very uh, as minimal an impact on uh, on global warming and, and on on the environment as possible. You can see at the top we've got a, a rock wool insulation going around the exterior of the whole building. The center is a, a system called uh, Build Smart that we used at our Blossom Park project, where the uh, seven inches of uh, e uh, XPS insulation uh, was adhesed right to the wood structure with the zip board uh, glued right to that on the outside and the whole panel was mounted to the building. So there's different approaches and it really does base it on each context. Um, and uh, uh, that should say modeling based on, model based on software. Uh, and so each software uh, that you're picking for Passive House can uh, can put all of these factors into the model. Um, there's a couple other examples where uh, the green girts on the outside of the building with the, uh, the rock wool insulation mounted right into that. Uh, there's a picture in the center there of the spray foam that was outside of uh, uh, the Cascadia clips, a fiberglass clip made here in Canada, uh, minimizing the thermal bridging, allowing the full standoff uh, for the insulation to fill that outside gap. And then uh, you can see on the bottom right there, you know, putting uh, the combination of exterior, what we've realized for um, some of the recent projects is having three inches of rock, rock wool on the outside plus six, six inches inside uh, is the right combination of insulation and uh, also related to, you know, the dew point modeling. And then uh, you can see on the bottom left hand side there, a huge amount of insulation on that project for the roof. Uh, it was the roofers were like, whoa, this is a uh, this is a lot. We're not used to this, but uh, there's no there's no heat loss now through that building's uh, that building's roof uh, for sure. You can see the center. There's the build smart panels uh, being installed. They come uh, pre uh, framed, pre insulated uh, and actually um, windows installed as well. So the only thing is air air tight air sealing the gaps and uh, and then that building was was assembled. One of the things that we do know is that uh, innovation does take a bit of practice. The, there is a learning curve. There was a learning curve for us uh, in adopting Passive House. Um, it was not, it was not endless, but it was it was steep. Uh, but we're we're realizing that it's really feasible on any building, uh, any scale. Um, 
you do have to make sure that the that the development matches the community's needs for us i mean when we look at a project we're not just trying to build to the maximum um and, and we're trying to build buildings that fit into the community's context but also then that the passive house um achieving passive house is actually quite uh, quite reasonably easy uh, with common materials and trades and it's becoming more replicable and cost effective at the first few times through uh, we were worried about a premium you know sort of the cost of the learning uh, the premium pricing that we were you know we'd heard about for some of these approaches and a lot of that is does come with a lack of familiarity and so one of the things that uh, we did in our first couple projects was actually work closely with the contractor on more of a time and materials basis. So whatever time it actually took them to achieve the airtightness, uh, you know, the detailing related to achieving the airtightness, we want to just pay for that rather than pay for how much they guessed it was going to take and have a huge overestimate. Um, that worked out very well for us. And on our first project, I think we had around a 25% uh, time and materials budget we were slightly over that, but on the total project, we were only about 3% uh, over the uh, the budget price, uh, which for a large scale renovation project was actually quite reasonable. So um, one of the one of the pictures, and I don't think I mentioned this earlier, um, we're working on a church conversion project uh, in Kitchener, and uh, you can see the sanctuary there. Um, this this uh, this project is going to be retrofitting. It's not a heritage designated building, but it is it is of heritage value. And we had to go through heritage committee. Um, one of the key things with that project is we are going to keep the sanctuary as a community gathering space, both for the tenant community and the neighborhood. Um, but how do you retrofit the sanctuary, keeping all the uh, beautiful architecture, etc., including the stained glass windows? Um, but uh, but make it airtight. And so we are using I can't remember it's called Aer aerocell or, or i can't remember the brand name but a, a sort of an airborne air sealing product uh, that will be able to uh, seal the gaps in the building we pre-tested it to see how leaky it was and then uh, developed a strategy to air tightness to get the air tightness for that a uh, large volume and then the rest of the building will be um, will be more of the conventional strategies we've built uh, built up uh, for the apartment sections of the building key to passive house uh, is uh, high performance windows obviously uh, historically those were all coming from europe and our first few projects uh, did have european uh, european windows there are drawbacks to ordering windows from europe um, everything from how shop drawings are prepared to shipping schedules to um, uh, hardware is different, uh, you know, getting somebody to come from Ireland to adjust the hardware is really frustrating. Uh, so we did a lot of work and uh, now Passive House certified windows are readily available uh, and uh, from North America and even here in Ontario, uh, one of uh, one of the better window companies uh, has gotten Passive House certified uh, fiberglass windows. So those are now uh, they're now readily available at reasonable prices. They're not particularly costly, uh, and uh, and that's made it a lot easier in specifying products for these projects. Um, you know, even puppies love them. Uh, it's exciting uh, to just uh, be in the. This is an example where um, Emma and I uh, and Flora, our little dog there, uh, stayed in one of our apartments recently, and uh, it was great to experience a passive house apartment because. You know, like we don't live in a passive house home. Most Canadians don't. And you know, what are the benefits of these apartments? They are super quiet. That's one of the things that really stood out first is uh, with the triple glazing, the air sealing, the, uh, the the lack of thermal bridges. All of these things actually contribute to a very comfortable living environment. And uh, it's just it's just lovely being in in the apartment and the air quality uh, you don't have the drafts you don't have to have these big uh, mechanical systems you know heaters sitting in front of windows etc uh, it's really lovely and the windows actually are a huge contributor to that um, speaking of air uh, heating systems uh, hvac is one of the key uh, principles of passive house obviously um, uh, mechanical ventilation with the building being so airtight it's obviously very critical to have uh, ample uh, fresh air. 
uh, this actually has uh, been, you know, become even more important, obviously, with the pandemic, where we realize air quality and indoor air quality makes a huge difference. Um, many of our earlier projects uh, are, were, were kind of conventional in the sense of, you know, you dump the fresh air into the hallway, hope that it goes underneath the door, and then it uh, naturally finds its way out through the kitchen vents or through the bathroom vents. That's a really poor air quality uh, strategy in terms of uh, ensuring adequate ventilation into the apartments because, you know, while the engineer may say uh, leave the door undercut an inch to get adequate air, the building code says you can't have more than a quarter inch underneath the door uh, for fire safety and also for noise and pests. You don't want to have these great big gaps underneath your apartment door. So with Passive House, we're delivering all of the fresh air directly to the apartment um, through ducted systems. We have so far been using centralized systems where we um, where we deliver fresh air from one of these larger uh, Swigon units or, or Tempf different systems, but um, where we take in the fresh air, it runs through the uh, uh, heat recovery or energy recovery ventilator. Uh, we pump it into the apartments. Uh, we exhaust uh, at the same rate from the apartments. So there's 100% fresh air delivery right to each home. Uh, you can see some of the uh, complexity that that means with the uh, with those um, uh, fire dampers and the systems going in and out of the apartment. Uh, this is actually becoming a little bit more complex to, to take this approach with some recent code changes in terms of what they require, require now for smoke dampers. So we might be actually looking more closely, well, we are looking more closely at individualized uh, heat recovery ventilation for each apartment. It changes the maintenance. It's hard, a lot harder to change all the filters uh, as you go around to every apartment, uh, or now you have to go to every apartment uh, rather than just going up and changing one big filter in the system. But uh, that may end up proving to be uh, less costly than trying to deal with all the new code changes for smoke dampers, etc. Um, on the left-hand side, there you'll see some of the early projects we did to Passive House. The one in the bottom is uh, just a Canadian-made non-passive house certified ERVs uh, we're finding you know, they're pretty they're pretty energy efficient for what we were familiar with but uh, not nearly as energy efficient actually as the passive house certified ones and on the top photo there a traditional boiler system with heat transfer and hydronic radi uh, radiators um, we did this in one of our, our second passive house building um, and realized that we were having way too much heating actually um, it's really easy to overheat uh, when you have these uh, large scale systems like uh, boilers and, and hot water rods um, or in this case we also had uh, indirect domestic hot water heating with like storage tanks so you can see there the tank is sitting there emitting through all the insulation 32.8 degrees celsius uh, so the boiler rooms were way overheating and we actually had to add uh, extra insulation and ultimately in one of them we had to add air conditioning just because the electrical systems were getting too hot um, this it, it's, it's it's very easy to overheat in that respect. You can see some of these uh, domestic hot water pipes. Um, the way the pumps and the and the piping works, uh, every time there's non-insulated metal, it's just emitting heat. And you can see in storage areas, it's very very typical to have one of these fan coil units. Even with the valve shut off, you can see that the uh, the the rods are glowing at 60 63 degrees Celsius. Um, with just sort of water sort of in the system. We realized that there was a huge cost to all of that piping and, and the heat loss. And so we've, with Passive House, you don't lose so much heat through the building envelope. And so we now have, have just started putting in little electric fan coil uh, heaters where necessary if, uh, if there was the risk of, of being too cool, but we find that they never actually turn on. So some of the projects, uh, just to kind of highlight some of the projects and what uh, what they are and what it's cost and, uh, and a few features. Um, we just opened this project. It was our second passive house project uh, through the design process. Uh, it ended up being the third one that we opened uh, just in terms of uh, timelines of development, but uh, it's a mixed use uh, project in Hamilton uh, called North End Landing. It's with James North Baptist Church. Uh, the church is actually the owner of the project uh, and Indwell is providing the affordable uh, housing and supports. Uh, it has 45 apartments, about 30,000 square feet of the building is the church spaces. Uh, it it costs uh, $226 a foot 
uh, and opened in uh, last August, August 2020. Uh, it's an amazing building. It's, uh, I think, the largest uh, passive house church in Canada and definitely one of the larger mixed use buildings. It has a gymnasium, it has a sort of a Sunday school and meeting spaces for, for 300. Uh, it has uh, it has many, many great features, including sort of a community cafe, um, that sort of fellowship hall for the church that spills over into a community cafe that comes out uh, onto the sidewalk through a patio area there. And then the 45 apartments upstairs. Tenants are loving living in that building. There's an example of one of the apartments there. It has a Mitsubishi uh, City Multi uh, electric uh, air source heat pump system for the building. And we actually removed the uh, hydronic system that was pre-designed into that building as we went through the system based on past experience, uh, just because we realized we didn't need to overheat nearly so much. This is a project which just opened in Hamilton uh, before Christmas. Uh, it's mixed use. Uh, it has a, a 50 apartments and a public library branch. Uh, it's designed to the FIA standard, and we're expecting to get the certification uh, you know, later this, uh, this winter, maybe next month even. Um, it was, uh, it was $258 a square foot for the total area of $34,800. Uh, it was just completed. You can see the photo there, um, uh, one of the drone shots for the certification. Uh, this was, the building was operational. Uh, the, you know, the systems were running. This was in December, so December uh, 10th. And uh, you can see the, the lack of any orange on that building really points to the lack of air uh, air leakage or thermal bridging on the building. Compare that to the 1960s apartment building in the background across the street, uh, and there's such a dramatic difference um, on the heat loss from that building. Blossom Park was our second project that we opened to Passive House Standards, but our third in design. That's the one we used the Build Smart system on. 34 apartments. It has a, a larger scale community sort of spaces within it for a, a kind of a campus that we have there. Uh, it has a lot of staff offices as well. Uh, for our program in, in Woodstock. Uh, it's to PHI certification. Uh, we're, we're pursuing PHI certification, I suppose international. It cost about 227 a square foot and it was completed in uh, July uh, 2019. Uh, it's all one bedroom apartments uh, for that building, including 20% uh, of the units being fully barrier free. We're currently working on a project in London. Uh, it's a mixed use project of 72 apartments. It has uh, a restaurant, so com three commercial spaces, including a restaurant and two rental retail units. Uh, one's gonna be a pharmacy, one's gonna be a, a, a bike shop. Uh, it's designed to FIAS, the Passive House Institute US design standard. Uh, it's costing about 295 a square foot. So it, the prices are a little bit higher for a number of reasons there, just in terms of the site and some of the complexity of the, uh, of the building, particularly the mixed use nature there, that uh, just the way it had to be laid out. Um, and it is under construction right now with the, uh, the foundations and footings, et cetera, going in. The, some reason that photo didn't show up, but uh, this is the church conversion in Kitchener, uh, where we're converting uh, the historic building, adding, uh, adding two stories, or we're taking off uh, the top of the partial second story that is there, putting it back on and adding a, a third story to the exterior, um, and then maintaining the, the sanctuary space as a community center. Uh, that's being designed to the FIA standards, as I mentioned, and uh, it's a uh, budget price that's just coming in is at $252 a square foot, it's about 33,000 square feet, and uh, it's gonna get started in, uh, in May. That photo is not yet, in that building, but uh, this is a, an apartment at McQuest and Lofts that uh, that just opened, and uh, St. Mark's is designed to be the same uh, the same style of apartment. You can see there in the top left corner uh, the Mitsubishi split system, and uh, and that unit uh, provides all of the heating and cooling for the whole apartment. Um, one little feature, and it's kind of hard to tell in this photo. Uh, the top of the wall on the right hand side, the, the demising wall between the living room and the bedroom, because these are one bedroom apartments uh, and usually single single person households, um, we, we lowered the wall from the ceiling up about 18 inches or so. And uh, there's great ventilation then throughout the whole apartment and the one, the one head for the uh, heat pump system is able to deliver 
uh, full heating and cooling for the whole uh, for the whole apartment. When we lived in this apartment uh, recently, that system actually never came on uh, in the week that we were there in terms of trying to add heating. It was in December, um, actually, sorry, in January, uh, winter conditions, but uh, the heat in the building is adequate. Uh, or just the, just the body heat cooking and the computers running, all those sorts of things, uh, that, the, that the, the heating system never actually came on. So we're in a time, uh, a complex time, obviously, with the pandemic uh, compounding many, uh, many issues, but you know, this broad consensus that we have a, a housing crisis. Uh, homelessness is real now in many communities across Ontario and, and of course, globally. Um, but we also have a climate crisis. Uh, it's sort of taking back seat right now to addressing uh, while well, we address the pandemic, but uh, how do we address maybe both of those crises at the same time? We think that it, to building affordable housing and affordable housing to passive house standards is actually one of the most strategic things that we can do as a, as a society and as communities, because we're investing not only in, in like permanent, very modest and or even low cost solutions to ending the homelessness crisis, uh, but also by building to these kinds of standards, we're functionally eliminating the GHG emissions from uh, from these kinds of buildings. And we're, we're providing a way that we can actually very feasibly um, build to a much better standard with current technologies, current trades, uh, current expertise uh, with minimal extra cost compared to building a, a generally well-built uh, building. Um, the key thing that we have learned is that it is very feasible to do this. And as we've expanded our scope and our reach of uh, as an organization, but also working with more and more contractors and trades, helping others realize that actually it's it's not too hard to do this. And we can do this with the, uh, the crews and the experience that we have. It's been exciting for us to be a part of this journey and to really be sharing this information with with others who are interested. So um, I'm happy to be a part of this conversation today with uh, with all of you. I think that's the end of uh, my presentation there, John. Thank you, Graham. Um, it's uh, it's very interesting and we have had some uh, some questions start to come in already, which uh, we will get to shortly. Um, so uh, just because I haven't said hello, my name's John Connell and uh, I'm working the social housing department uh, at the County of Simcoe, so I'll be helping out with the uh, steering the questions section here. Um, please feel free to keep asking your questions uh, as we go along and then um, we will in the majority of cases publish the questions for everyone to see. Um, if there was a, a question we didn't publish, we would uh, try and deal with uh, with it privately, but uh, keep the questions coming in. Um, before we actually start um, uh, dealing with them, and Graham will be, uh, I suspect, handling most of them, um, we do have uh, another speaker uh, just uh, to give a, a quick overview of, uh, of an opportunity that's coming up uh, in Innisville uh, in the county of Simcoe. And so uh, Katie Bailey, who's a plans examiner with the town of Innisfil, uh, is going to give uh, an overview of uh, an exciting opportunity uh, with Habitat for Humanity. So Katie, over to you. Excellent, thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this forum and to the uh, county for uh, setting this up for us. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about a project that we're working on in the town of Innisfil. Uh, that we're pretty excited about, uh, really embodies uh, sustainability and affordability. So just to give you a bit of uh, background, uh, late last year our council adopted a resolution to donate a parcel of vacant town-owned land uh, to Habitat for Humanity to build you know, a truly uh, sustainable and affordable development project. Uh, this uh, project will not only be our first Habitat for Humanity project, but it's also going to be our first multi-residential passive house project and potentially one of the first of its kind in Canada. We do have another uh, passive house uh, in Innisfil. It's actually owned by our councillor, Councillor Waters, who I believe is on this call. Um, and, you know, we've learned some lessons uh, through that project, but this will really be uh, an interesting challenge for us. So 
let me just get right into it. So you, you may be familiar with the traditional habitat for humanity model, uh, you know, where habitat would uh, build and provide a home for a family in need. And then after so many years, those families, you know, they'll, they'll move out and take the equity from, uh, from their house and buy a new market house. Uh, often those homes would end up being sold to the market, uh, resulting in the loss of that affordable unit. So under this new model that's been sort of changed and in my opinion approved, uh, improved, the families are set up with a 0% interest mortgage that's geared to their income so that every dollar that they put into the house, both in terms of uh, mortgage payments as well as any improvements they make to that house, uh, goes into a sort of uh, equity pot. And then when they're ready to move on, uh, that equity is given back to the homeowner and can be used as a down payment uh, for their next house. So the home then gets transferred back to Habitat for Humanity, who gives it to a new family and that cycle continues. Uh, this is really great for us for um, here at the town of Innisville because it means that by donating this land to Habitat for Humanity, uh, we can provide this sort of perpetual leg up um, and bridge that gap between rental housing uh, and uh, on to market home ownership. So um, if you take a look at the chart there in the lower left side, uh, not only are they you know, paying less each month and able to save uh, more money, but they're also um, they're also able to save a you know a significant amount over time uh, and there's more money that goes in their pockets for you know life's expenses so so that's sort of the affordability component um sorry let me just switch over here uh, the other side of this uh project is the sustainability side so one of the requirements for this project and a condition of that land donation is that it be built to passive house standards, uh, which you know could be 80 to 90 percent more efficient than a typical code built home. So not only a great again for energy conservation, but more money uh, in terms of lower utility bills for these homeowners. Um, the other part that we're really trying to set a focus on is the community building aspect. So looking at are there ways that we can make the site more of a community site and bring that neighborhood together. So, you know, we're looking at things like uh, community gardens, parkettes, uh, stormwater improvements, uh, etc. Um, just in the lower right hand corner there, that's a picture of a park in uh, in New York City. Um, I think it uh, rapper 50 cent sponsored that park. Uh, we don't we don't have a rapper sponsoring our project yet, but uh, who knows? So. Uh, and then in terms of sort of our next steps, uh, we are in the early planning stages. Our next stop is within official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment. So, you know, if, if someone's interested in getting involved, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we're also looking for families. I know Habitat for Humanity is currently screening uh, different families to make sure that they qualify for their, their model. Um, and yeah, that pretty much sums up our project. We're really excited about uh, about the impact that it will have in terms of addressing our own affordability crisis. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of work to do, but it's a very positive step for us. So I believe uh, we're now going to open it up for some questions. And um, perhaps maybe I'll get it started with a question for Graham. So Graham, I, I, I assume that this screen will transfer back to you, but uh, I guess my question is, you know, for us, this is our first time building this kind of project and getting involved. What would you say would be sort of the biggest challenge and how did you address it the first time around? First of all, Katie, congratulations on the project. Sounds really exciting. So um, that's, a, that's excellent. I think that the biggest challenge um, the biggest challenge we had and probably be, you would have as well is just making sure you rethink the basics of when you're trying to shoot for passive house the thermal bridging is the number one thing that none of us realized how little we knew about um, and so what do you need to do in order to uh, insulate you know, from your foundations and around through the whole building it's fairly simple actually once you get going um, and doing it on a modest scale like the scale you're talking about uh, of, a, of a structure um, it's not difficult to get the thermal bridging right but that's the biggest uh, 
the biggest rethinking. And then, you know, working with the, the, the folks who are putting the building together to just make sure you focus on uh, attention to detail on the air tightness. Um, it's, it's not rocket science, it's just, uh, it's just a little bit fiddly sometimes. Uh, that would be the second thing. And then, interestingly, operationally, making sure that, you know, for the homeowners, that the, the systems that you're going to put in place are are easy for people to look after and maintain. So, you know, in terms of designing uh, the HVAC systems, the ventilation to go into the um, into these homes, making sure that uh, you know when you're doing filter changes, those are easily accessible, etc. Um, but I think that you're you're well underway in terms of being able to come up with like the right resources and uh, the experience to put together a great project. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Katie. We'll we'll keep you uh, on the hot seat there, Graham. Um, there, uh, can you see the questions? We've got uh, got ten questions come in so far. So uh, just take them in uh, in any order you like. There. Sure. Okay, I just got them going here. That's great. Um, I did I did type in an answer with some technical details about the window manufacturer. So I mentioned the three we've used. Uh, Clearwall, uh, which was the first uh, three projects we used them. They're uh, a five, uh, CPVC window from Ireland. Uh, the next we used was VEDA windows uh, on the most recent project. They're very beautiful uh, wood window with aluminum cladding uh, from Poland. The delivery time and, and logistics and back and forth, you know, cross-continental uh, supply chain issues uh, were real for both of those products. Uh, so you know, it did make us really interested in finding something that was more locally made and uh, inline fiberglass out of uh, Etobicoke uh, has really leaned into the challenge of getting their already great windows up to Pacifier certification and they recently got certified. So I believe we have their windows on the next four projects. And uh, one interesting thing is most of the windows we were getting um, from Europe didn't have bug screens, for instance, but all of our local bylaws require bug screens. Uh, and so these were like added little extras that you had to make sure you caught in in the process of shop drawings and everything and and they didn't get caught a few times and you got to ship these extras and all of that. So those are the, the little hiccups that came up along the way, which had nothing to do with Passive House, but had to do with the supply chain of, of products that we weren't familiar with. The next question, I'm just, uh, just reading it there. Notice, noticeable difference in building time. That's a really, uh, it's a fear that we all had. Is this going to take a lot longer to build? In the end, actually, we're finding um, these buildings are very constructible. You do, uh, you do need to focus on through the process of one project to the next. Uh, we have uh, improved. We have improved ourselves, and we have improved as a, you know, as a team in terms of focusing on things that do make a difference in the in the in the constructability. The detailing of uh, under slab, the below grade work, I think, is where there's a lot of hidden time. Uh, depending on which approach you take, PHI or FIAS, um, will change what's required in terms of full under slab insulation. Uh, we're finding on some of our recent projects, we don't necessarily need to insulate under the footings, for instance. Uh, there are products to like foam based products to put under footings and engineers are fine with that. Building departments are even fine with that. Uh, but the constructability does get more complex uh, when you start getting into like insulating right that that far under the footings. Uh, it, it, and that takes a bit more time. I think that overall, though, once you get going on the building, the, the key difference is not the overall time, it's the sequencing of, of parts of the project. It's very familiar for builders to like throw the walls up, get the roof on, and then work backwards down around uh, air tightness, the, the building envelope, etc. Um, in order to do the air tightness testing, the first test, particularly if you're shooting for certification, you have to have a number of air tightness test milestones. And when you can get the building enclosed really matters. I mean, larger scale buildings, you're going across seasons. And so we realized that you need to get that roof on, uh, but you may have to put the roof on before you've done your air tightness testing, but you don't want to cover up the air tightness layer. We talked to a few developers. They said, look, if you're attentive to the details and you've got a good roofing crew and you're not puncturing the, the air membrane on the roof, you're safe to put it on even if you haven't tested it. Just make sure your your transitions are accurate and tight, etc. And don't don't be fearful because you can't delay 
putting your roof on and you can't delay your air tightness testing until springtime when you're in the middle of January. You have to keep going. And so those were some of the things that we learned about paying attention to the details and not stressing, which, which relieves stress actually if you pay attention to the details and it keeps the project moving. There's many trades involved in these projects. There's many things happening simultaneously and you, the, the site super and the project manager for the, for the construction really do make a big difference in keeping that schedule going while integrating the passive house strategies. I kind of got a little bit long winded, so hopefully it made sense. Um, so when I'm stating the square footage prices, what is not included in those numbers? Um, so in, not included in those numbers would be like land costs. Uh, that doesn't include uh, you know, soft costs for the design team, etc. Uh, it doesn't include uh, you know, building permit fees, that, that would be the full construction costs. We do typically include, I'm pretty sure that we're including the full tendered price in that uh, in that figure. So that would usually include our landscaping and, and maybe site servicing and things as well. Um, so it uh, it's, a, it's a pretty inclusive price for the cost of constructing the project. Um, it, we do find it really difficult to get comparative numbers for cost of construction and everybody likes to use the cost per square footage as the uh, as the comparator and so we have had criticism from others oh gosh we could build it for 180 bucks a foot it's like yeah but you're not including and the list of what's not included in that 180 dollars a foot is usually pretty long actually um, we even had uh, a modular builder quota project and it was like well it doesn't include the elevator it doesn't include the foundations doesn't include and the list of exclusions was longer than almost longer than what it did include and so by the time you got to the end it was about 350 dollars a foot uh and so we're like well you know these are the complexities of trying to compare you know different kinds of apples i guess in a sense it's like you know the honey crisp is a lot more money but people really like it for a lot of good reasons and I think that that's the one of the inherent complexities of comparing projects uh, on a price per square footage basis. I'm not sure that was like a fully truly satisfying answer because if I was listening to it, I would like to dive into more details, but I'm not sure how to dive into more details uh, without knowing more of what's behind the question. Uh, so I think the next question is kind of similar. Square footage budgets you've shown are the total project costs or just hard costs? Um, I mean, on a global price number, like when we're looking at a site now or we're looking at a project, we know based on all of our experience in the different communities we're working, some of which are impacted by the GTA pricing, obviously, uh, we know that it's costing more than $300,000 to build an apartment now. Um, we, we haven't seen people building for less than that to any kind of energy efficiency standard, any kind of like long-term durability standard. And because we're building it for the long-term, we, we're always making a decision towards like better quality, uh, durable products, you know, from the kinds of drywall to the kinds of millwork, flooring materials, et cetera. So um, our baseline for what we were doing compared to what we're doing now, probably was like less of a Delta than if you're just building pure code compliance versus passive house. There's no there's no question about that. Um, when we acquire, acquire properties, what are the land costs? Well, there's always the land cost. Um, we have yet to have somebody donate a pro property, although we are working with a couple municipalities now where they have some civic, like municipal land, parking lots, et cetera, where they're contributing that as part of the, um, the total project value. Um, but uh, land is, uh, I mean, if we can get it for $20,000 a unit now, we're thinking that that's a pretty good deal. Uh, Hamilton is uh, in a very, very rapidly appreciating property market. Um, in Mississauga, it cost us 2.65 million to buy about half an acre. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very troubling in many communities to figure out how to get the land. Um, particularly sort of urban communities, how to afford the land to build affordable housing. Um, in smaller communities, and we're seeing maybe you know further away from the GTA, we're talking to some folks in Chatham or St. Thomas, 
the availability of land is not the issue. Uh, it's other issues around how do we, you know, put together the funding, put together the support costs, you know, bring together the whole complete picture of of, uh, of developing these kinds of housing projects. That those are more of the issues rather than the actual um, the actual land values. But anywhere in the GTA, we're seeing uh, we're seeing land as as a complicating factor for sure. Uh, what is the typical cost per unit? I, it's uh, Jason Allen's question at 1047. I don't know what the typical cost per unit is, it's like a generalized number. We used, uh, we've used like Altus or some of these other sort of industry benchmarking uh, companies to take a look at numbers. We fall definitely within the uh, within the range of industry standards for the kinds of projects that we're building. Um, so in that respect, we feel that uh, the, the price per unit is competitive. Um, we are seeing a constant pressure upwards on the pricing, uh, trade availability, uh, you know, shortage of even materials, etc. in some cases. Uh, lumber prices, of course, this year, have, I think doubled in some areas. Uh, so those are drivers for uh, cost appreciation. I'll make a small dig for uh, improved process or at least timeliness of reviews and things. Uh, you know, we always complain as developers about, uh, you know, things just take too long and if there wasn't rules, we could just do so much. Well, it's of course we need rules, but the reality of how long things take to get approved does drive costs. And we know that in recent times, it's been almost 1% a month, uh, the cost escalation that the industry has seen. And so, you know, when we have to go through site plan approval and it takes 10 months versus six months, that's an extra 4% that just got added to the total cost of the project. And so those are real, those are real things. And we say the same thing to our contractors. You know, we, we need to get this done in these amount of time because otherwise we know if we tender in the spring versus tendering now, uh, we'll see these kinds of, these kinds of big increases. So. Um, has there been an impact on operating costs? This is a great uh, question because it's the crux of the issue. You know, if, if we can't afford to operate the buildings, you know, there's a real driver to burning gas because it is fairly cheap to buy uh, and the technologies to do it are pretty reasonably priced as well. Um, we always externalize the cost of, of pollution as a society. Uh, so how to account for that is real, but practically speaking, we're finding tenants that we're finding as we monitor, we're trying to like get together a full monitoring program for all of our buildings to actually, uh, you know, coalesce all of this information and we'll hopefully have that available to share more broadly uh, in the next number of months. But uh, we are finding that tenants who are running their running their apartments, um, many of we do have sub metering for the electricity for, for our units. Many of our tenants actually have a credit on their account because if they have uh, the Ontario Energy Support Program uh, OESP subsidy, uh, they get a fixed amount for their utilities and they're often finding that they don't use that full electricity uh, budget because they just don't need to. Between the LED lighting for um, uh, low, like low electricity LED lighting, uh, the not heavy load to heat or cool the apartment, um, they just aren't using much power. Um, the systems where we have, um, where we haven't met our expectations in the modeling, are the more complex misuse, uh, mixed use buildings. When you have a restaurant or a, or a community food center, or community, you know, like a neighborhood food hub in, in the building, it really does change your energy use and it doesn't model well into the software. Uh, how much, you know, how much gas is burning, how much ventilation is running for this functionally a restaurant kind of kitchen. Um, that, that, hasn't, that hasn't matched the modeling um, and so, uh, you know, obviously it, it's not hitting the pure passive house standard on that. Uh, that's the Parkdale Landing Building. Um, but functionally, the building is a great building to operate and to live in. And so uh, some of the expectations have, weren't quite quite aligned there. It was also our first project to passive house. And so the learning curve was real for that one for us. Um, regarding the uh, HVAC uh, control systems, Mission just uh, central. Do we use a central building automation system or just standalone controls for each piece of equipment? 
This is a uh, complex and evolving um, question. We we originally thought uh, that uh, having decentralized controls, fully decentralized, was going to be the way to go, so that everybody controlled everything and it'd be much less complicated in terms of, like the building operations. That that didn't work out great because then we couldn't figure out where the problems were lying or what was running and what was not running at the same time. So we did actually add. Uh, a BAS back into or onto our first project and have gotten a lot more control over particularly ventilation rates. We had vent, like ERVs running way too high volumes uh, and, uh, and huge, huge electricity costs for um, motors running. Also, like uh, we realized that when the boilers in the first project had uh, boilers, hydronic heat uh, in common areas, uh, in community spaces, uh, and also um, it had uh, indirect hot water heating for the domestic hot water. The boiler's set point was off and uh, the sensor on the outside of the building was, was not functioning correctly. And so it was running at full capacity all the time. Uh, so heating water to its full capacity, which I think was 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we were running with huge, huge costs and, and way, way out of range, um, gas and electricity. And that we didn't know that because it wasn't tied to any kind of system that monitored that for us. The BAS has helped us bring a lot of things under control in that building uh, for the centralized systems. The tenants themselves, though, do have, um, setting aside the first project where the tenants have very little control because all of the heating and cooling is delivered through the ventilation air. It's kind of like pure passive house, but actually not that, it's not that ideal in our context. Uh, all of the rest of our buildings have tenant controlled thermostats for the um, uh, for the heat pump units within their apartments. It's central is semi decentralized, so they have the wall pack in their apartment that they can control. And then the roof system is uh, maybe one rooftop unit for eight or 10 uh, apartment units. So we share the costs of running that system between the tenant off their meter and the centralized house meter. The BAS system has been really important for centralizing knowledge of when those systems are running or whether the coils are working correctly or uh, are they, you know, how how the demand between heating and cooling splits and, and sort of figuring that out has been important for us. Um, so uh, we are finding that a, a modest BAS system within the projects is really useful for managing the electricity, particularly the electricity use and, uh, and also the the comfort factor of the system's operations. There's a bit of learning there that we need to continue doing. Um, and what we've also realized is that everybody models buildings. The energy gets modeled for everything, right? You got to do SB10 for a basic building, or you got to do PHP or Woofy Passive for, for Passive House. There's other energy modeling softwares, obviously, as well. Nobody will go as far as saying nobody ourselves included monitors after the fact, like how we're building actually performing where are the issues and what can be corrected. And so we're really working hard because we're doing enough of these to actually bring information together, improve ourselves, but hopefully actually share that information. Arlene, I see you on the, the call here too. You know, with CMHC, how can we share that information through networks to get to get it to get it out to the community about how to actually run these high performance buildings? Because if we're going to get off gas, we have to shift to something like electricity. And if we're going to do that, it is more expensive than burning gas. So how do we make sure it stays within economically viable uh, ranges? And then how do we also make sure that we're actually improving as we go the comfort, the air quality, all the other things that we actually can improve by making these changes? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'll just catch up on my questions here. Do you work with municipalities to deliver affordable housing through a partnership? If yes, what does the process look like? What are the roles and responsibilities? Uh, there's a lot of factors to this question. Uh, we could probably do a separate workshop just on this one. Um, we do work with municipalities in every case uh, because affordable housing is a civic priority and is a public responsibility when it comes to uh, deep affordability and particularly supportive housing. We are we are not a public organization in the sense of uh, government owned, but we are public benefit in the sense of as a registered charity. And so our partnership looks like strategic cooperation. 
How do we help get the waiting list down? How do we help get tenants who or people who are living in hospital but don't need hospital moved into the community and living in their own home with the adequate supports? The partnership is around a functional delivering of the outcomes. And practically speaking, you know, it can, it can and is starting to look like what can we each bring to the table? We might be able to uh, fundraise from the donor community. The municipality might have some land or they could waive some fees. Uh, these are all practical things that can be contributed to reducing the overall cost of a project and the, and the speed of delivery of a project. Um, when a municipality sees itself as a partner rather than just, you know, the regulator, uh, it really, really speeds up a process and makes it a lot more convivial. And we, we have good, excellent relationships with municipalities. I should say our best processes and our best successes are where the municipality sees us and we see the municipality as an ally towards the outcomes. Um, we could get into like a hundred more layers there, but uh, we're, we're seeing as homelessness, street homelessness particularly, becomes real across the province, um, the role that the municipality can play is increasing in making the solutions happen uh, as we work together. Uh, Graham, we've, uh, we've still got uh questions uh, coming in um, just to, uh, just to flag we've uh, got about five minutes or so to get through as many of them as we can sure okay I'll stop talking so much um, <laughs> the church re there's one about church retaining ownership um, we we are starting to work with other groups to retain ownership and we act as the developer with some sort of operating agreement um, it's very worthwhile thinking through that, you know, whether it's a legion or whether it's a, a rotary club, there's lots of organizations that might have some land and we can find a way to do that together. Um, uh, the 1% increase on costs, I mean, that's just sort of a, a generalized number uh, starting during the building season, etc. Those things do matter too. Although we're finding that m many times contractors are now sort of like working through all seasons. Um, and all the site to project cost land. I think maybe I answered some of those questions. Uh, testing and inspections. Um, I don't know the percentage increase over typical OBC, but I'll say two things that are really important. The testing for the air tightness. Um, if you're not shooting for certification, that's a lot cheaper because you don't have to get a third party consultant. And we found that our current passive house consultant can do the testing, but if you're certified, you have to get the third party. Um, I would say the other thing that we're finding is building commissioning matters, getting the system set up at the end to operate correctly rather than just make sure the power's on. That's a really key thing. Uh, in terms of tenant feedback, uh, tenant feedback is uh, people are loving these apartments. Uh, they're quiet, they're fresh, they're, uh, the air quality is good, um, they're easy to operate and they're comfortable temperatures. Uh, those are, that's, that's feedback from tenants. You know, they don't necessarily see the inside of the wall systems or the, uh, the mechanical, uh, but they're enjoying living in the apartments. I think, I think there was one uh, just earlier up, uh, um, which if you didn't want to comment yeah. on it, that's fine. But it was talking about um, Canadian manufacturing. I see that there, yeah. Systems. Yes, yeah. Uh, I do know Minotaur, yes, I do. And uh, we haven't yet had a, had a project where that was the right technology for our apartments. Um, but uh, we do know them well and uh, they're on our radar. Uh, as an option and the fact that they're Canadian made, very important. Uh, and um, I think it is a very promising product and I would love to see uh, an opportunity where we can use that. So far, our apartments have been, uh, the size of that system is just sl slightly larger. It's a bit too large for the size of our apartments um, as we've been building these one bedrooms. Be very well suited to a two or three bedroom apartment uh, in maybe some developments, but just the ones that we've worked on especially where we've had centralized ventilation. This might become actually more of an op option for us as we shift to uh, individualized unit ventilation. Did I manage to get to get everything, John? I think I think you have. Now now we've got two minutes extra. Oh boy. 
Um, one question I had uh, actually was um, you've mentioned um, uh, a couple of standards, FIAS and PHI. Yes. Oh, like broadly speaking, what, what is the difference between those two? Uh, beyond spelling, uh, the PHI is Passive House International. It's, uh, it's the standard that's based out of Germany. Uh, and um, and passive FIAS is Passive House Institute US. It's a standard that was developed uh, in in the US for more North American uh, context, where we do have you know many climate zones. Uh, we have multiple you know from deserts to Arctic, uh, and it's a standard. In the end, we feel that uh, we're achieving probably the similar kinds of outcomes that we want. It's different ways of measuring. Uh, different ways of modeling to achieve those outcomes rather than uh, uh, in the FIAS is it more site specific or more climate zone specific. It does focus on some elements though like uh, tenant comfort, how long does it take to get hot water to the unit, the unit compartmentalization air tightness testing. Some of those are FIAS standards which are more onerous than the PHI standards and so each has its own uh, pluses and, and minuses or, or pros and cons I guess. Uh, but uh, we've we've worked and built to both of them. Thank you. Well, uh, that was a, that was a great conversation, Graham. Um, really appreciate that. And um, um, I'm just checking if there was if there was another question before I uh, before we move on. I don't think so at the moment. But uh, very, uh, very informative and uh, a lot of interest out there, obviously. That's great. Well, I realized I didn't put my contact information on there, but if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you. So um, um, we are uh, we're coming towards the uh, the end of the morning, um, but before we do, um, we have Arlene Etchen with us from Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, Arlene's in the uh, outreach team there. And um, Arlene's just going to share um, uh, a few pointers on some of the CMHC resources uh, that, uh, that may be of interest to you. So Arlene. Great, thanks John. Hopefully everyone can see my screen at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you and, and thanks to our presenters. That was really uh, terrific uh, presentations. Graham, it's always great to hear about how um, things are evolving and, and especially being able to have Canadian manufacturers for some of the, uh, some of the work that you do. And Katie, very inspiring to hear about this uh, upcoming build. So I'd also really want to take a moment to thank um, my, the team at uh, the, at Simcoe because this has been such a wonderful experience and these forums are working out uh, I think really well and um, great turnout. I was going to say you know when I was putting together my notes I thought about um, Canada's role in passive housing and I, I don't know how many of you know this but of course um, the, peop the passive house standard was started in Germany but it was inspired by Canadians um, back in the 70s, of course, when there was the energy crisis, uh, the province of Saskatchewan commissioned uh, the research council there to develop a solar home. And a lot of the techniques that were developed there around air tightness, you know, and, uh, and vent ventilation systems with heat recovery, uh, those ideas were taken and used in Passive House. And 40 years later, the Passive House Institute actually recognized those Canadians as being pioneers. So a little bit of fact for today, but uh, on to the resources that might help you. So um, a number of the projects that uh, that Indwell did uh, were funded under the National Housing Co-Investment Fund. We supplied some of the funding for that. We've also supplied some funding to Habitat for Humanity under this uh, particular fund. And so for those that aren't familiar with it, the Co-Investment Fund prioritizes partnerships between governments, nonprofits, private sector, and provides low-cost loans and forgivable loans. And the focus of this fund is to develop deeply energy efficient, like Passive House, accessible and socially inclusive housing for mixed income mixed tenure and mixed use affordable housing. So projects that can be funded under this fund range from shelters and transitional housings to indigenous 
mixed market, and new construction. Um, of course, there is criteria for this, the prioritization criteria, uh, vulnerable residents, minimum five units. It's got to be affordable and financially viable, energy efficient and accessible. Um, and I guess if you want more details about this, uh, you can go to place to call home .ca. You also might consider um, some seed funding for the startup. I know, Graham, you talked about some of the costs with some of the permitting and, and developing piece. Some of those costs can be covered under seed funding. Um, so if you want more details, uh, general information about these funds or any of the other NHS funds around research or innovation, please feel free to contact me. I will put up my contact information. If you have land and you're ready to go, uh, my colleague uh, Nadia Vanafro is the contact for uh, CMHC funding in the Simcoe area. Uh, I also wanted to share some research pieces. If you go to our website, cmhc.ca, and use the keywords passive building, you're going to come up with a bunch of case studies from across Canada about different passive housing project on our low energy buildings fund, uh, including this one actually that will uh, will go, goes over some of the work that Graham talked about today in Indwell. And uh, so you might get a few more details on that. And there's my contact information for more details. Anyway, thank you again, everyone, for participating. And thanks again to Simcoe for another great event. Thank you very much, Arlene. And with that, we're almost right bang on on time, which is awesome. Um, this concludes today's event. Thank you, everyone who made time to join us today. We absolutely appreciate your participation, the involvement and your engagement with asking so many detailed questions and, and our presenters abilities to be able to answer those questions. I found um, particularly enriching in this, in this forum and I really appreciate everybody's um, ability to, to really jump into the questions and provide key information. So thank you so much to everybody, including our participants. Um, a very special thank you to our presenter, Graham Cubitt, Director of Projects and Development at Indwell. Um, Graham, for your absolutely riveting presentation on creating energy efficiency through passive housing. Um, I was uh, totally blown away by your use of photographs in the presentation and how you actually outlined some very tangible details, very specific information um, that I think is going to be really value added for a whole range of participants on the forum today, including the county's own staff. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I really appreciate your comments on how you have created a future ready approach to uh, Indwell's um, uh, focus on the next several decades looking forward. That's really progressive. Compliments to Indwell on that. Um, I appreciated all sorts of the, the details, for example, the windows, the, uh, the, the, the different types of construction that Indwell has done. You've done a range of different types of construction, how you've made different types of installation materials work within those different types of construction. And I really appreciated the information on things like when you order from Germany or Ireland and they don't come with bug screens, then it's an issue. So those um, also added a little bit of levity to our session today, or at least I found them funny um, living in a uh, mosquito area uh, as we do. Um, the county can really appreciate um, your comments, Graham, on how the cost of land can interplay with the cost of construction, particularly when there's such a range of um, property prices, uh, not only across the county, but also across Ontario and, and actually across Canada as well. Uh, and, and we really can understand that interplay into the, uh, into the formula of what makes something affordable and not quite as affordable. Um, so thank you very, very much. Thank you also to Katie Bailey, Plan Examiner and Building Process Specialist from the Town of Innisfil. Really, really impressed to hear of your partnership with uh, Habitat for Humanity, and we're really keen to, to learn more about that and to um, keep tabs on your progress on that project. So thanks very much for, for sharing that and for braving the technology as we embrace this today. Um, 
thank you to our social housing and IT staff for behind the scenes uh, work and making the technology work for this forum series. And also thank you very much to John Connell for moderating the session, moderating the questions, and then knowing when to hit on on your video so that you come onto the screen in time, which is awesome. And sometimes uh, I think I still have to learn that particular knack. Um, lastly, a big thank you to Arlene Etchen and Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation uh, for the amazing resources and your continued support in our ongoing efforts to do this virtual series. We, you know, a year ago we were all set to go into our forum, our one day affordable housing forum and oh my gosh, how much the world has changed since then. Um, thank you. Without CMHC's support, we would not be um, doing this virtual forum series. So really, really appreciate all of that. So just logistically, um, once again, as I said before, a recording of this event will soon be made available on the county's website. And to find it, you go to simcoe.ca forward slash our AHPPS. And you can also access uh, videos of the previous forums um, there as well. Participants, again, blown away by uh, how engaged all of you were. Please join us again for another future, future virtual forum uh, over the next coming months. We will be hosting several more of these on a variety of different topics related to the creation of affordable housing. And actually, even in the Q&A today, we, we've had more suggestions for more topics. So I guess that's one of the, um, the um, positives of actually doing this series by by virtual forums is that we can pivot and we can create new uh, sessions as we go along. Thank you everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and please stay safe. Bye now. <laughs>